February 6th, 2351. An unspoken terror stalks the frontier. While most colonists attempt to live peacefully, an increasing number, motivated by a noble patriotism or a dark hatred of the other, have taken up arms, blurring the lines between soldier and civilian, and sowing the seeds of doubt and discord. All the while, the great fleets of Cardassia and Starfleet find themselves at an impasse. Cardassia's new high-tech fleet lies immobilized, undersupplied, and outgunned, holding on to their gains by the smallest thread. Meanwhile, Starfleet is becoming increasingly embroiled in a seemingly endless uphill battle against civil disorder and terror. Neighbors now look upon each other with either suspicion or hatred. The optimistic ideal of the morally enlightened citizen diplomats has been shattered by xenophobia and paranoia. Now Starfleet alone and under siege is all that stands between the frontier and chaos. After their defeat at Minos Corva, the Cardassian military spent the start of 2351 licking their wounds. Much of the fleet deployed during Operation Mir Lusar had developed serious engineering issues, forcing many back to port for refit, leaving Cardassian gains vulnerable. This was only made worse by the failed gamble at Minos Corva, which saw a Cardassian fleet repelled, worse still, Reports stated that Starfleet had captured two of their new warships, negating any advantage of surprise. In reality, it was of little consequence. Starfleet engineers only confirmed what had previously been observed, that these ships, while a significant improvement over the previous generation, were still some 30 or 40 years behind Federation technology. Meanwhile, Grand Gull Precor now stood alone as the de facto leader of Cardassian forces on the frontier after the arrest of Legate Chazuk. Prekor, after carrying out a detailed analysis of the engagement at Minos Corva, made several conclusions. The first, that Cardassian commanders should only engage with a 3 to 1 advantage, any less, and they would end up being outgunned by Starfleet. Secondly, Cardassian officers were ill suited to carrying out any kind of dynamic attack which required initiative and imaginative thinking. Formalized education had only been recently introduced on Cardassia, and such a reform had yet to make any impact on the military. While literacy rates had shot up, higher education necessary for training officers remained woefully lacking. Thirdly, Precor found that the current doctrine of pod tactics were extremely limiting and inflexible to command in large groups. This doctrine mandated that the large, slow Equal cruisers should be escorted by two to three Kulinors under the command of the Equal's commanding officer. The intent was to create a well-rounded formation capable of responding to a variety of threats. In reality, the doctrine often brought out the worst in both classes and overtaxed commanders. And while it was somewhat effective in small engagements, Minos Corva demonstrated its ineffectiveness on a larger scale, as a commander was unable to mass ships of a kind to be used in a decisive action. Therefore, in his report to Central Command, he suggested a new system of linear tactics be developed, increased training for field officers and future classes to integrate this doctrine more effectively although for the moment these appeals fell on deaf ears, Galtar Obrek being more concerned with purging political enemies. On February 6th, Commodore Necheyev made her move, commencing Operation Shadani. Named for ancient Andorian warrior, it began with a series of probing raids on Traken and Hackton, testing the Cardassian response. Whenever the Cardassians saw an inbound fleet, they would call for reinforcements to converge on their position. 
so that a system nominally defended by one to three ships was in fact protected by as many as nine. Necheyev realized she could exploit these tactics, and by using probes emitting a transponder signal, she created faint attacks. When the Cardassians responded, other planets were left vulnerable. The single ship left behind would suddenly see five Starfleet vessels bearing down on him, and he quickly decided to flee. The battles of Salva, Panora, Beltani were all decided without a single shot being fired, and eight weeks into Operation Shadani, the Cardassians were forced to abandon Traken and Hackton, lest they be cut off and surrounded. Necheyev had the Cardassians on the back foot and wished to push the offensive further and capture the Ashilan, Ankana and Ararath systems, thereby interdicting the passage of Cardassian ships into the frontier and splitting Cardassian holdings in two. Unfortunately, while President Berthier's administration favoured decisive action, much of the old guard at Starfleet Command felt that seizing Cardassian colonies so close to the recognised borders would be a dangerous escalation, and so Necheyev called an end to Operation Shadani on April 6th. Regardless, the job was far from finished, with a total of 12,000 Cardassian infantry holding Federation colonies hostage. Retaking them would be no easy feat, as discovered by the USS De Gaulle, beaming down 200 of her crew in away teams to liberate them. Hackton stood among the larger colonies in the frontier, with a total of 250,000 colonists, the vast majority of whom live in open country in small farming collectives. However, the settlement of Tarovka is home to 50,000 colonists and is a substantially developed settlement. Here, the Third Order had deployed three battalions to occupy the settlement. After eight months of occupation, they had dug in and turned Tarovka into a fortress. Transport inhibitors forced de Gaulle to beam down her away teams outside the settlement. Little did they know, they were beaming into kill zones pre-sighted by Cardassian defenders. A hundred Starfleet crew beamed down, only to be gunned down by Cardassians with disruptor rifles. Captain Burgoyne attempted to salvage the situation by sending down rescue shuttles, only for one to be shot down by anti-air. Antelope and Bear Platoon would remain pinned down at the transport site for another two hours, while Crab and Donkey Platoons beamed down some 10 kilometers away as to avoid being caught in a similar trap, before outflanking and infiltrating the Cardassian firing position, finally relieving Antelope and Bear Platoons. They then advanced into Turovka settlement, only to become bogged down in street fighting, with every building concealing the Cardassians. After 24 hours of fighting, Burgoyne was no closer to liberating Turovka, all he reaped by his effort was some 48 officers wounded and 21 dead. In retaliation, the Cardassians had executed 20 civilians and warned Starfleet that further assaults would cause further reprisals on civilians. The next day, the de Gaulle was joined by the USS Cairo. Captain Edward Jellicoe took control of the situation. Rather than embark on a costly ground assault or persist in a siege, which would cause the civilians more suffering, he instead opted for what he would later call aggressive diplomacy. During the parley with the Cardassian commander, he would make unreasonable demands and threaten the destruction of the entire colony before storming out. Later, his first officer would make a back-channel communication to his opposite number, offering to be more reasonable. This combination of brinkmanship and good cop bad cop strategy proved immensely successful, with all Cardassian forces on hacked and surrendering by April 10th. Jellico would use these same tactics at Salva and Traken, although controversially, the Cardassian Glyn at Salva only surrendered after murdering his superior who had planned to call Jellico's bluff. Jellico's negotiation tactics were based on information learned about Cardassian culture. It successfully played upon their respect for strength and their military insecurities. Most Cardassian troops were conscripts and many officers were corrupt and poorly motivated. 
A further benefit of these surrenders was the fostering of informal communication between the two sides. This significantly helped to avoid escalation. Many believed that they had sowed the first seeds of peace. Unfortunately, behind the lines the situation was rapidly deteriorating. Since the shuttle bombing in December, relations between Federation and Cardassian colonists had broken down, and so by mid-June, Necheyev's task force had become spread thin along the frontier. And even with Starfleet trying to maintain order, violent incidents occurred on a daily basis, perpetrated by both Cardassians and Federation civilians. With Starfleet stretched thin, Precor resumed anti-shipping operations, using pairs of Kulinors, stressing supply chains to colonists and further aggravating tensions. In 2352 alone, a total of 27 Cardassian paramilitary actions took place, claiming the lives of some 300 civilians and untold property damage. While in the short term, these paramilitary radicals proved useful to Cardassian Central Command, it was quickly realised that it would have significant long-term consequences. Chiefly, they threatened the authority of the Central Command, itself only six decades old, and as such, fears of separatism and a breakaway state weighed heavily on the minds of the Central Command, which had put such effort into developing their frontier colonies. And on March 4th, 2353, these fears seemed to be vindicated when the USS Hawking, an Oberth-class science ship, was attacked without provocation, when a Cardassian cargo shuttle rammed her, crippling her and killing 63 people. At the same time, a bar on Renara, favoured by Starfleet personnel, was attacked, killing 12 people and injuring, and injuring dozens more. A few hours later, a message was broadcast on an open subspace channel. A Cardassian paramilitary group calling themselves the Order of the Scorpion claimed responsibility and threatened to carry out further attacks, unless Starfleet withdrew from the frontier. Necheyev was quick to act, and on March 6th, she ordered all privately owned Cardassian vessels on Federation colonies to be locked down and impounded, down to the smallest impulse skiff. The Cardassian colonies of Panora, Velos, Brimmer and Quetal were blockaded, with every ship passing through undergoing an inspection. In response, the Cardassians instituted a similar blockade around occupied Federation colonies. Then, on the 15th of March, Necheyev seized all subspace transmitters and relays throughout the frontier so as to prevent any further coordinated attacks between paramilitary groups. In so doing, she had also taken control of the flow of information in and out of the frontier. The emergence of the Order of the Scorpion seemed to confirm the worst fears of Cardassian Central Command, demonstrating a disturbing level of coordination and planning for their attacks. And despite Starfleet's best efforts to mitigate these attacks, they continued, although they were not nearly as lethal as the first wave. Regardless, attacks accelerated in frequency, claiming the lives of an increasing number of Starfleet personnel and civilians, Necheyev was running out of options. Then, in late August, Necheyev received a back-channel communication from Grand Gull Precor with a proposal that seemed too tempting to refuse. His message read, Both of us desire peace and order. We only differ upon the particular manner of order. I for one abhor anarchy, and I believe you do too. Let us put aside our present differences, if only to prevent chaos taking hold. Necheyev, intrigued by this olive branch, ordered Captain Edward Jellico to dig further into this proposal. In the meantime, she would use this respite to secure further reinforcements to the region in the eventuality that these negotiations broke down. By mid-November, an agreement had been reached by both parties regarding the action to be taken against Cardassian paramilitary groups. The Central Command offered to secure the cooperation of Cardassians living in majority Federation colonies. It was agreed that these civilians would be placed into Starfleet's protective custody, 
so as to protect them from reprisals by other civilians and, with the cooperation of military intelligence, would help to weed out paramilitary members, who would then be extradited by the Cardassians. The civilians who remained would then be either repatriated or relocated to Cardassian majority planets in the frontier. This proposal seemed to solve all of Necheyev's problems, however, she was not ignorant of the potential publicity disaster. Veil it in whatever language they may, this was nothing less than the internment of private, law-abiding citizens. Fortunately, she had control of the flow of information in and out of the frontier, and she could be confident that most Federation colonists would applaud these actions. Nevertheless, she secured herself some insurance. Meeting with President Bertier, Necheyev briefed her on the Cardassian proposal and assured Bertier of her confidence in the plan, and that she anticipated no problems. Trusting Necheyev's proposal, she signed off on the plan, codenamed Operation Nomad. Between December of 2353 and late March of 2354, Starfleet rounded up a total of 150,000 Cardassian civilians, securing them in several safe haven colonies dotted throughout the frontier. While the Cardassians in these colonies were treated very well, with many amenities such as replicators, holodecks, well-furnished accommodations, education facilities, it did not change the reality. These safe havens were nothing more than cages, gilded as they may be, and susceptible to the same dangers as any other cage. In mid-June 2354, disaster struck. The safe haven colony on Umoth 4 suffered an outbreak of Cymbeline bloodburn, a plague which had ravaged Cardassia barely two decades before. While Starfleet did what it could to contain the outbreak, the close conditions of the safe haven colonies were ideal for the spread of the disease, and the medical staff on site couldn't keep up with the rate of infection, and soon many of them became infected as well, along with many other Starfleet personnel. A relief ship was sent to evacuate those who had not been infected, and treat those who had. Even so, the damage had been done, and when on July 10th the Haven colony had been shut down, of the 10,000 Cardassians held in custody, 967 had died from the infection, with 3,143 suffering permanent organ damage. Upon finding out, many Cardassian officers in the Central Command were outraged and demanded that Starfleet be publicly denounced and for Grand Gull Procor to carry out reprisals against Federation civilians in the occupied territories. Precor, still hoping to end the war, did what he could to temper Cardassian responses, but he was helpless when on July 23rd, an intelligence officer on his staff, named Glyn Madred, leaked the entirety of Operation Nomad to the Federation media. The story quickly ignited and spread like wildfire. Merely 12 hours after the first stories were published, talk of an internment scandal quickly took the front page. Realising the danger she was in, Necheyev issued a press release a mere two hours before President Bertier's own press conference. Necheyev stated that she had merely been carrying out presidential orders, and she had carried out her orders as a loyal Starfleet officer. Thus, the attention of the press shifted to President Bertier, who in denying her knowledge of the risks, would only confirm that she had approved the plan in ignorance, and therefore either appear incompetent or callous. Trapped in an impossible position and facing a publicity disaster, President Bertier resigned on August 3rd, 2354 in disgrace. This left the future of Cardassian policy in the Federation uncertain. Many Cardassians demanded Precor to launch an attack in retaliation for the internment of Cardassians. Ultimately, he refused to do so, as he still hoped that Starfleet would turn over any paramilitaries they had captured, and secondly, he believed that public opinion in the Federation was turning in their favour, and he believed that Cardassia could benefit by appearing as a victim. Unfortunately, his integrity would cost him, and he would be relieved on August 10th. Yet, his successor would have it no easier 
as Commodore Necheyev now sought to burn the Cardassians for their treachery and bring an end to this war in a devastating offensive which she described as setting their skies on fire. This she would appropriately codename Operation Phoenix.